recording. All right, very good. All right, so let's start with word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for once again bringing us through another week. And as we enter your Sabbath, Lord, we ask you'll be with us uh, for our Friday night Bible study. Lord, guide us. Send your spirit to be with us. Give us wisdom and understanding, Lord. We thank you for us. these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. So our study this week, uh, and we're getting close to the end. I believe after this week, we have three, three studies left and we'll be done with our sanctuary study. But for tonight, this is a mouthful. It's the eschatological <laughs> day of atonement. Now, can anyone tell me what eschatological means? Oh, I meant to look at it. I, uh, I, I don't remember, but I think the final, the final event. It is the final, the final event. It points, it's, it's related to the final events. Yeah, I'm but I, 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 I forgot it. I should know what that means, but. I'm yeah. just curious if anyone knew what the word actually meant. <laughs> I meant to look it up before and I forgot, but it's me too. <laughs> it's relating to death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind. There we go. All right. So this was remember the day of atonement in the sanctuary was pointing forward to the resolution of the sin mm -hmm. problem. And so the eschatological day of atonement is the fulfillment of all of that. Mm -hmm. okay. But uh, yeah, so it is pertaining to all those things. But yeah, it's a, it's a mouthful. Right. The final events. Kind final of. events. And, and it is really uh, the event that brings us into the last days. All right. Okay. So we're going to be spending most of our week. Last week we were in Daniel 7. This week we're going to be in Daniel 8. It's funny because when we do a Daniel study, we're going to cover all this material again. <laughs> but it'll be Rep lightly repeating is good though. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it'll be a slightly different perspective because we'll be studying the book of Daniel after having completed the sanctuary study and instead of the other way around. All right, so Daniel 8 14. And here's our key verse for the night. It says, And he said to me, for 2,300 days then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now remember, on what day was the sanctuary cleansed? In, in the old rituals. <laughs> on the Day of Atonement, right? All right, yeah. Yeah. All right so but now it says for, for 2,300 days, so it says after that much time passes, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. So we know we're not talking about the annual cleansing because how many days are in a year? 365. Yeah, 365, right? So that's definitely not the annual cleansing. So we're going to be discussing just what it is that, that was referring to. Mm -hmm. So in our last study, we saw that Daniel 7 clearly toits to a pre-advent judgment. That was the whole point of our study last week. This week, we're going to, we're going to be studying Daniel 8. We'll discover the real issue of the conflict between the horn power and God. And we will see why the cleansing of the sanctuary, beginning in A.D. 1844, is God's perfect answer to that challenge. And we'll look at how we come to that date as well. Now, for those of you who were in uh, Wednesday night, a prayer meeting when we went through the book, uh, 1844 Made Simple. Uh, some of this will look familiar for those who aren't familiar with the book. I do have a copy right here. Mm -hmm. It's a great yeah. read if you haven't got if you haven't gotten it and read it. Yeah. It's not real thick as you can see, but it does a great job of explaining how we came to that date, 1844. And it does it all from the Bible, so it's it's a great book. All right. So we're going to be seeing this chart again later, but I wanted to review it beforehand. Uh, it shows the the parallels, of, I guess, between Daniel seven and eight. Remember Daniel 7, we started off with the four beasts. There was the lion, which was who? Babylon. Babylon. The bear, which was? Media Persia. Right. The leopard, which was? Greece. 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 Right. And then there's the fourth beast, which was? Pagan Rome. Pagan Rome, which oh, uh -huh. grew into the little horn. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after the little horn, there was a pre-advent judgment. And after the pre-advent judgment, there was a transfer of kingdom to the saints. And it was a definite order was established there. 
Well, in Daniel 8, we're going to see that that first power is left out. And, and it's just, I mean, I'm sitting asking who it represents and all that's over on the on that yeah, third column. That's why I was doing so, <laughs> yeah. So it was really easy quiz. Hello, oh, Jerry's coming back. Okay. Right. Yeah. Oh, I, got I like those kind of quizzes. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Me you're too. welcome. So in Daniel we 8, go. we're going to see go. a, go. we're going to see a ram, a he goat, the little horn, which is the same little horn from chapter seven, and then mm -hmm. the cleansing of the sanctuary and how all of this times um, with Daniel seven, because remember everything goes in a set order. And so if those first events go in that same order, then this next event must be coinciding with that, uh, what we saw in Daniel 7. So we'll see this again in a little bit, a little while. Okay. All right, so now we're going to start reading Daniel chapter 8. And uh, we're going to start with uh, verses 1 through 8. And Carmen, can you kick us off? Sure. Daniel 8, 1 through eight. Okay. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision that it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushem in the palace, which is in the providence of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Ulai. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he could according to his will and become great. And as I was considering, behold, and he and he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram and he was moved with the collar against him and smote the ram and break his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the he goat waxed great, very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. All right, so there's some things we're going to talk about here, and then we're going to get into these questions. Notice it in verse one when did Daniel have this vision? During the reign of Belshazzar. Right, and it said in the third year. If you go back at Daniel 7, verse 1, it says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. So two years had passed between the, the vision of Daniel 7 and the vision of Daniel 8. And do, what do we remember about King Belshazzar? Um, when he was drinking with the people there and uh, and uh, and then a uh, uh, a hand was writing invisible hand was writing was writing there the end of the end of that of his uh, kingdom right this was the king that was on the throne when babylon fell to the mm -hmm. Persians, right so his time is just about up when he's having this vision right so that's that's an important thing to keep in mind and the reason we do that because you notice here when it's talking about the animals uh there's a kingdom missing yeah which is the kingdom of babylon right so we had in here we, we saw the similar here uh to what we saw in daniel 7 is the succession of powers right we see 
the uh, ram, one horn bigger than the other horn. If you compared that to uh, the vision in Daniel 7, you're right, you had the bear is um, up, you know, kind of lopsided. One side was bigger than the other. Uh, but here we're, it's described as a ram instead. So we know that the bear was Media Persia, so the rams must be Media Persia. And it actually gets explained later, which we'll see in the chapter. The angel will explain and actually say who this is, which is why we know this is the correct interpretation. And then it has the, the male goat, which came at it furiously. So that has to be who? Oh, it it has to be Greece, right? Because we know that the Greeks are, are the ones that defeated the Medes, Medes and the Persians. And oddly enough, the angel will actually confirm that later, that it's the Greeks, which is really fascinating because at this point in time when he's writing this, they're just a bunch of um, loosely aligned tribes. There's no power in Greece at this point. Uh, so to think of them as toppling a power that toppled Babylon would be incomprehensible. But, but it's what happens. Uh, so we can see that there's some similarities here between uh, chapter 8 and chapter 7. But if we read on a little bit further, there's going to be some differences. Um, now there, there are some differences we've said already. So one of them was Babylon's missing. Now, why do you think Babylon's missing in this case? If they're getting ready to fall. <laughs> yeah, Babylon's <laughs> time... It's Babylon's funny. time on the world stage has come to an end. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's about to fall. There's no future uh, for Babylon, so there's no reason to include it in the prophecy. And then the other obvious difference is, is the animals are different. Mm -hmm. So that's going to come into play a little bit later. We're going to take a look at why are, why are the animals different. Now let's go through the next section. We have Daniel... Chapter 8, verses 9 through 14. And are you able to read that for us, Jerry? Yes. Okay. And then, Paula, if you'll be ready to read verses 23 through 25. All right, you can go ahead. Daniel 9, 8 through, or Daniel 8, 9 through 14. Mm -hmm. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the, his sanctuary was cast down. And the host was given him against a daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, so the question, the question here is what is the little horn attacking? It's attacking heaven. All right, so it's, it seems here, right? It says, even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, right? Mm -hmm. Which is Christ. He cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Um, now the host would be God's people, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, and by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away in the place of the sanctuary was cast down. So it's, sounds kind of like it's a religious attack there. It's attacking the religious system. And then verses 23 through 25. Okay. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. 
Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. He, do, he shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human hand. All right, so, it, and this is, of course, where the angel's giving the explanation of the little horn power, and it's talking about a king uh, who is going to be deceitful. Mm -hmm. uh, he's even going to rise against the prince of princes. So this is a king who try, sets himself up uh, as the prince of prince. Right. right? Uh, you know, as basically trying to take God's place here on earth. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. So the horn power interferes with the worship of the divine prince of the host. It removes from him the daily, which is a reference to the daily sacrificial service in the earthly sanctuary. Now, what does that mean? When he takes away the daily, what did the daily represent? Isn't that the sin offering? That was the sin offering, right? That was where the priest mediates, right? They would come and confess their sins. Uh, the priest would mediate that with the lamb of the blood and uh, transfer that sin to the temple. So it's taking away the daily. So it's taking away that mediation by the priest, uh, which means the sins are not getting transferred uh, to the temple anymore. All right, so that's, that's what it means to take away the daily. So it, it's substituting something else for that. The horn power usurps the responsibilities of the heavenly priest and interrupts the continual worship of God on earth. It acts like another captain of the host, waging a religious war against the divine heavenly prince, his sanctuary, and his people. This is what the little horn is doing. And mm -hmm. if you recall way back just before we started doing these this series, uh, the sermon I did was actually session one, where it's why, why is it important that we understand the sanctuary? And then we went into all of this type of stuff, the attacks on the sanctuary. And uh, when I'm all done and I send out all the slides for everything, session one is actually from that sermon. Um, but it says here, now the little horns attack, the, the taking away the daily by the horn power represents the introduction of such papal innovations as a mediating priesthood, the sacrifice of the masses. Now, by mediating priesthood, you know, in the Catholic Church, they have the confessionals, right? They'd go in, little confessional, they confess to the human priest who would help tell them to do whatever yes. penance uh, they would assign for them to go do. Uh, and, and that was supposed to uh, expunge them of their sins, so to speak which takes the place of what Christ did. Christ died for their sins. All you have to do is confess it to Christ and it's gone. Um, so they've done that. The sacrifice of the mass, uh, which is a whole different creature altogether. Of course, the confessional we talked about and the worship of Mary, uh, by which it has taken away knowledge of reliance upon the continual ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. If you look at all those things, you can see how that takes away uh, our dependence on Christ for our salvation and puts it in human hands, which is uh, not, a, not a reliable thing to do. Now, let's look at the question that was asked in uh, verse 13 again. It says, then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices in that transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? So what specific issues were prompting this question? What are the concerns you think that Daniel was seeing that, that made this question so prominent. Well, anything that has to do with the sanctuary, Daniel would be upset about. I mean, if the sanctuary was everything. So now somebody's going to trample on it and, and um, yeah, I guess it's going to be trampled in, in the daily sacrifices. So I think that's 
what it says in the verse. In, in those days, uh, in a Jewish society, the entire society revolved around the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You know, always compared to our society today, everything revolves around celebrities, pretty much, <laughs> of various kinds. Uh, it's just a weird, weird situation. But yeah, everything in Daniel's day revolved uh, for his his people, for the people of God. It all revolved around the sanctuary. That was the center of their worship. It was the center of their hope for the future and and, and as a nation. Uh, so this was a, what he saw an attack to wipe out God's people and God's power here on earth. In the scriptures, the question, how long, always asks for the present situation to be changed. It's found directed to people by God and his prophets. We're going to look at some examples there. And then we're going to see where it's also acts uh, going the other way. So who are we to now? Lydia. All right, Lydia, can you read Exodus 10.3? Okay. And then Rosemary will have you read Numbers 14.27. And then Nicole will read 1 Kings 18.21. The second here. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus say the Lord God. Excuse me? Did you say something? No. Oh, okay, so I have, I have to, so, to, tell, to read it again. So Moses and Aaron came into the Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God on the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. All right, so what was the situation that uh, needed to be changed here? This, this is when they were trying to leave slavery. Right. Pharaoh was needing to let them go. <laughs> right. The Hebrew people were being held as slaves by Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And so this was uh, God asking Pharaoh how long are you going to be stubborn uh, and refuse to submit to me and let my people go? Basically, this is what God was asking to Pharaoh through Moses and Aaron. Now, Numbers 14, 27. 14, 27. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. All right, that one's pretty self-explanatory there. What was the problem that needed to be corrected here? The, the Israelites were, were basically complaining against God. Right. Mm -hmm. God's people, right? His, his chosen people were whining and complaining about every little thing. <laughs> and it was 40 years of whining and complaining. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was... Uh, 40 years of dealing with a bunch of two-year-olds. God, God's very patient, that's all I can say. Um, but yeah, so, and that needed to change. He's like, look, you know, I am trying to lead you through the promised land, right? I brought you out of Egypt, but yet, and then there, every time something bad happened, we should go back to Egypt. I'm like, you remember what was going on in Egypt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you people were slaves. You were working uh, seven days. Pharaoh didn't give you any days off, right? I mean, it was a terrible life, and they were thinking about going back to that. Well, let's look at uh, 1 Kings 18, 21. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. All right, so you remember what was going on in, in uh, Israel at this time? This is when Ahab was king. Well, Ahab was yeah. king, yeah. The <laughs> Jewish people. They were, <laughs> they were worshiping Baal. Baal. Now that God still had a temple, they would go and they would go and do both. Some people were doing both. Mm -hmm. It was, it was uh, our situation. He says, "Look, how long are you going to go back and forth? Right? You need 
to figure out who the real God is and worship the real God. If it's Baal, then worship Baal. If it's God, then worship God. And of course, we all know how that turned out. That's just the one where the fire came down. And <laughs> yeah. And all those priests of Baal got killed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So those were the situations. Each time God's saying, God's asking people, how long are you going to persist in your wicked ways uh, before you repent and come to me? Now, it's also directed to God by people. And we're going to look at two examples here. Uh, the first one's uh, Psalms 94.3. We'll have Carmen read that one. And then, Jerry, can you read Revelation 6.10? Yes. Let's start Psalm 94.3. Psalms 94, verse 3. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how, how long shall the wicked triumph? To hear David's asking, you know, how long are you going to allow all the wicked people to triumph and persecute your people before you do something about it? And then Revelation 6.10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? All right, so again, these are people being persecuted and they're asking God, how long is he going to allow it to continue? And this is the kind of question we're seeing asked in Daniel. So the angelic cry in Daniel 8, 13 is lament over continuous distress, a plea for a change and a call for divine judgment. Now, remember, this is part of a prophecy. It's a vision of the future. So he's seeing the people persecuted down through the ages. Uh, and, and the angelic means like, how long are you going to allow this to go before there's a judgment? Now, we know there's a judgment because we studied it in Daniel 7. But how long mm -hmm. before that will happen? Such a question expresses the expectation that God will finally triumph. God will do something, uh, and he will not just let that go on and on indefinitely. So once we understand the human condition and the prophetic time in which we live, how should we respond? And this would be uh, Paula. Paula. Yeah, Paula, can you read 2 Peter 3, 11 through 13? Okay. Okay. Three. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved... What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Yeah. So what's going to happen to everything here on earth when Jesus comes back? Gone. It's going to be destroyed, right? It sounds there like the uh, whole, whole place is pretty much going to be burned up. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, yeah, when you read through in, in Revelation, which is describing the second coming, you don't know how there could be anything left on the planet after that. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, putting our faith and trust in things of this earth doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it's all going to be destroyed. Right. So what should we be focused on? What should our response be? Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Focus on the heavenly things. Because, you know, when Jesus comes back, what's going to happen in heaven? Did you say what's going to happen in heaven? Yeah, what's going to happen in heaven? well for, for a little while <laughs> for a little yeah. while it's going to be pretty quiet it's because he's coming down here right. with be all down. his angels right so it's going to be empty but then we're all when going he goes back there. then we go up there it's going to be populated i mean right now having you i get this picture in my head 
this massive colossal city that is largely empty. Mm. And, and they basically, the people that are, or beings that are there now are basically watching over the place, waiting for the tenants to move in. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so when he comes down here and gets us, then all of a sudden, all of that is going to be at our disposal. And that's what we should be focused on, those things. All right. So when we read Daniel 8, 14, and now this is the response to the question, how long, right? What happens at the end of that 2300 evenings and mornings? Mm. Then the sanctuary is cleansed. Sanctuary is cleansed, right? And remember on the day of atonement, what did the, the cleansing of the sanctuary represent? That's when all the sins, sins were removed from the sanctuary, right? Or that's when all of the sin that had been accumulated in the sanctuary over the year, all the sins of all the people were permanently removed from the camp, mm. permanently removed from the, from the people and destroyed forever. So that's, that's what's going to happen here. But now it's talking about the sin problem is going to be permanently erased for God's people. It's going to be gone away. Now the phrase evenings and mornings reflects language from the creation account, signifies a day. It implies that God using his own creative force will counter the destructive activities of the horn and its host. Because we read there um, in verse 25 says, he shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. So this mm -hmm. little more power is going to be defeated by God's creative power, not mm -hmm. by any means known to man. Okay. So what does it mean that the sanctuary will be cleansed? That's the th next thing we, we, we look at. And there's really several aspects. I mean, we know that this was the removal of sin, but... When you're talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary, there's a relational context to it that denotes restoration. And we can look this up in uh, Isaiah. Uh, whose turn is it? Rosemary. Rosemary. Okay. Is it Rosemary? Yeah. Well, no, it's Lydia. Lydia, did you read last or is that Paula? I read last, I think. Okay. okay. Lydia. Oh, Lydia. Lydia's turn. All right. Hmm. We both got off track this time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought you were gonna have somebody so, Isaiah what? Isaiah chapter 10 verses 21 to 23. Okay, chapter 10, 21, 23. Went through this in Sabbath school a few. Okay, it says in here, the remnant will return to remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. To, to 23? Yes, all the way through 23. Okay. Okay, for throw, uh, no, for, yeah, for tell your people, O Israel, we as the sand of sea, the remnant of them will return the destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God or host will make a determined end in the midst of the all the land. All right, so he's talking here about a returning remnant. Mm -hmm. uh, so here it's talking about a remnant that's going to return to God. And, and this is prophesying about a literal return. But it's also um, can be applied in the future towards the prophetic return of God's people to God in, in heaven. But it says in verse 23, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. He's going to make an end to the problem, right? And he's going to redeem that those people of him that have returned to him. So that's a restoration of that relationship uh, between God and his people. 
in another context, the sanctuary denotes the actual cleansing and purification of the sanctuary itself. So it says when the sanctuary is cleansed, it's removing all the sin from the sanctuary. And that was, remember, the physical transfer through the blood manipulation, where the priest went in with the blood uh, of the sacrifice that did not have any sins confessed on it, so it was pure blood. Well, in the heavenly sanctuary, of course, it's cleansed by the blood of Christ, which is pure. And uh, he's removing all those sins that God has been storing up uh, where, you know, he's taking on uh, the guilt of those sins uh, for us so that we wouldn't have to pay that price. And then in a legal context, it also denotes vindication. Remember last week we talked about judgment brings vindication. Well, the cleansing of the sanctuary also brought vindication for God's people at the end of that, that yearly cycle. But let's look up two texts. Uh, it is Rosemary's turn now, right? Rosemary, 1 Kings 8.32, and Nicole's going to look up Isaiah 50, verse 8. We have not yet gotten. Okay, 1 Kings 8.32. Okay. Then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the wicked, bringing his way on his head, and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. All right, so remember the day of atonement uh, was the day that the righteous were redeemed, the righteous were vindicated, and the wicked were cast out. So anyone who had not... Uh, confessed all their sins and gotten all of that out held from the people and they were gone they were removed from the camp and then isaiah 58 he is near who justifies me he will contend with me let's stand together who is my adversary let him come near me all right so that's isaiah is pretty confident here he's talking about he is near who vindicates me. So he's talking about Jesus. He vindicates me. Uh, you know, who, who he doesn't have anyone to fear, right, in the, in the judgment because his vindicator is God. All right. So those are three, three different aspects of cleansing the sanctuary. So it's not just the physical removal of the sin from the sanctuary itself. It's the restoring of the relationship with God and the vindication of his people. So when the sanctuary is cleansed, the sins of those people are, are removed forever. Those people are restored to that relationship with God that was established in England, in uh, Eden. I almost said England. <laughs> established in England, yeah, you know. E Eden. <laughs> I don't even know where that came from. And then the people are vindicated in the eyes of the unfallen world. They're going to know that, hey, these are people that we can trust. They're not going to bring the sin problem back. And uh, it vindicates, of course, God's decision, God's judgment and his mercy for saving them. Well, let's look at this chart again. Right. So the work of restoration in Daniel 8 equals the divine judgment in Daniel 7. Because they both come right after the little horn. So the pre-advent judgment and the cleansing of the sanctuary coincide. They're two different ways of looking at the same event, which we call the eschatological day of atonement, which is a mouthful, right? <laughs> and here we see that judgment was given in favor of the saints against the evil little horn power. So the world needs to know that justice and judgment, as predicted in Daniel 8, 14 will come and that now is the time to accept the salvation offered us in jesus and we're going to be getting uh, talking more about this next week when we're studying our prophetic message as it relates to the sanctuary so that brings us to the restoration of the holy so remember the day of atonement restored the holy or the the sanctuary the inner compartment uh completely so let's look at revelation 14 verses 6 and 7 we're back up to carmen yeah one moment 
14. Okay, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. All right, so looking at this, and this is um, getting into the three angels message, right, which is our prophetic message. But in these two verses, what do you see that ties in directly with the judgment of Daniel 7 and the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8? Do you see any references to judgment? Yes, I'll say so the, the hour, hour of judgment has come. Has come, right? So when There's Daniel's some... writing about it, it's a future event. Ah. Right? It's a future event. It's there's going to be a judgment. And remember the angel, the angel cried out, Well, how long? Or we have to wait for this judgment comes. Now, here, when John sees this vision, the angel is going around instead of saying, how long do we have to wait? This angel is saying the judgment is here. here. It is now. Right. And then uh, you see any special ties as far as the cleansing of the sanctuary goes? Um. Remember what we just studied? What are the, the three different aspects of the cleansing of the sanctuary? One of them is the restoration of the relationship between God and his people. And you see here the angel is calling people back to worship, yeah. to worship God, worship the creator. Him. They're calling them back to that relationship, to reestablish that relationship. Uh, so that's, that's the tie-in there to the, uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary itself. Now, the Day of Atonement in Daniel 8, the target of the horn's assault is God's heavenly sanctuary and his people. All right? What does the future hold for them? Only the Day of Atonement can bring the sanctuary and the people of God back to their right state and justify God and his dealings. It has to, that has to happen. Because remember, all year long, as they went through the daily sacrifices, none of that restored the people that was just cleansing them of that sin at that point in time but but they still had that broken relationship so the only thing that would get them right turn them to the right state and justify god in his dealings by forgiving them was to have a day of atonement it was necessary so what are the connections to the sanctuary service found in these verses in Daniel 8? We're going to look at and uh, we're going to look at Daniel 8, 12 and 13 and then Leviticus 16. And I've lost my place already. I'm pretty sure it's Paula. Is it Paula? Well, did we skip Jerry? Did Jerry did Jerry read Revelation? No, Carmen read Revelation. Yeah, Carmen, you read last, right? I did. All right, Jerry. Yeah, it's been a rough week. <laughs> I am, I am so thankful. The weekend is here. <laughs> okay, so Jerry. Wow, okay. I need to, I need to stay. Up. I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. All right, Jerry. Yeah, can you read Daniel eight, twelve, okay. and thirteen? Daniel 8, 12, and 13. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast it down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. All right, so reading, reading those verses, you see a few references there to the sanctuary service? 
Well, the daily sacrifice. Daily sacrifice. Uh huh. That's definitely there. The giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. Right. And it actually mentioned the sanctuary. Yeah. Right. So now let's look at Leviticus 16. And this would be Paula. It, and just read verse 16 and verse 21. Paula's muted. Are you reading, Paula? Paula, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, I was reading. I was <laughs> just going along. <wrong. laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And then verse 21. 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away until the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. All right. So you see here, it's talking about the... Uh, in verse 16, it's talking about the uncleanliness of the children, their transgressions for all their sins. Uh, so he needs to make atonement, right? So do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them. And then in verse 21, you see him actually putting the sins of the people on the live goat and sending it out to the wilderness. Mm -hmm. We talked about how that's Satan who bears the responsibility for all the sin he instigated. And the, the relation you see here in Daniel 8, of course, he's talking about the transgression of desolation, um, the daily sacrifices, which was this transferal of sin. So it was interrupting the removal of God's uh, removal of the sins by God and the eventual transference of that guilt to the goat, mm -hmm. which we saw here in verse 21. We'll see some more correlations here. Verses 20 and 21. And, Levit and just leave your thumb there in Leviticus 16 because we're coming back to it. Uh, that whole chapter, by the way, is about the Day of Atonement, which we studied a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. All right, so Daniel 8, 20 and 21, and this is Lydia. Okay. The ram which you said you, you saw having the two horns are they the kings of media and Persia? And the male god god is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes, it is the first king. All right. And as to 20, 21 and 22? No, just just do 21. That's far enough. Okay. okay. All right, so again, we see here the ram and the goat are the two animals. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to get into why are, are we using those two animals. But notice here that he, the angel clearly identifies the ram as media Persia and the male goat as the kingdom of Greece. Mm -hmm. And the large horn, remember the male goat had a large horn, which was the first king. Now, the first king of Greece was who? Oh. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, right? He united all those individual uh, Grecian kingdoms into one uh, and went out and conquered the known world. And uh, now I know the description said that that horn broke when Alexander died and four other horns took its place. Well, when Alexander died, his kingdom was split up into four parts by his four generals. Mm -hmm. So that's... That's another way to identify it. But the angel clearly identifies that that is Greece and that that little horn is Alexander the Great. It doesn't mention him by name, but he says he's the first king and Alexander was the first king. All right. 
And then let's look at Leviticus 16.5, and that'd be Rosemary. 16.5. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. All right, so notice the animals here. Now, this is specifically for the Day of Atonement. It's saying two goats and a ram. Yep. And the, the, in the vision of Daniel 8, the, the beast we see is a goat and a ram. So these are sanctuary animals, which is another clue to Daniel and to the readers here, that this is talking about religious warfare. It's talking about the sanctuary and the impact that's going to have on God's people. So the, the horns war in the, is in the realm of religion is countered and cut short by divine inter intervention carried out in the context of an eschatological day of atonement. I can hardly say that word. All right. So it's, again, all of this is going to be cut short by God's intervention. As God demonstrated on the day of atonement that he is just in his dealings and judgments, forgiving the loyal and to judging the disloyal and rebellious, so the eschatological day of atonement will verify that God is just when he saves and when he punishes. And remember, we talked about uh, last week that even the wicked are going to confess that God is just in condemning them. Okay. So the term for vision in the question in Daniel 8.13 refers to the entire vision of Daniel 8.3-11. So when it says, how long, we look at the question here in verse 13. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation? Well, he's talking about the entire vision. So you have to go back to not just the little horn, but all the way the act to the beginning of the vision, uh, which encompasses the time of media Persia. And it's important to, re to remember that. Uh, we'll get that here in just a minute. Uh, but it goes from Media Persia through Greece and Papal Rome all the way down until the uh, cleansing of the sanctuary. So when the length of the vision is given as 2,300 evenings and mornings, we should therefore understand it is covering that entire span. All right, so we know that the beginning point has to be somewhere during the time of Media Persia. All right, so what text verify the vision pertains to the end of time which means that it goes all the way to the end and this is in daniel is it your turn it's my turn all right nicole's going to read these three daniel 8 17 19 and 26 so he came near where i stood and when he came i was afraid and fell on my face but he said to me understand son of man the vision refers to the time of the end thank you and he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. And verse 26. And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. All right. So it seems pretty clear from those verses that we know that the vision extends to the end of time and is many days in the future. So it's not a near event, it's a far event. But we also know that the vision has a starting point sometime during the reign of the Medes and the Persians, because that, that was the first kingdom. All right, so that gives us the span of years that we're going to be looking at. Now, why do we apply the day for year principle to this vision? And we have two different texts we're going to look at here, Ezekiel 4, 5, and 6. We'll let Carmen read that, and then Jerry, you can read Numbers 14.34. Yeah, cool. Ezekiel. Don't have to go too far back for that one. Sorry. Okay. Ezekiel 4, chapters 5 and 6. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity... According to the numbers of the days, 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And, the, and when thou hadst accomplished them, 
lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. All right. Well, that was kind of a strange demonstration, having him lay on his side for so many days, but he clearly states that each day is a year. So each day he's on his side represents one year of transgression. So that's kind of the punishment. That's symbolism we have there. And the number is 1434. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. All right, so why did the children of Israel wander around in the wilderness for 40 years? It wasn't because they didn't know the way out. Right? They knew the way out. God showed them where it was, and they refused to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they broke the promise. Other place. Yeah, but they broke the promise. Remember, they scouted out the land for 40, for 40 days, uh, came back and gave a false report. People chose to go away. So God sent them back out to the wilderness. But there's two texts there where it shows uh, the day for a year principle. So that's why we use that. All right, we did have someone just join us. Um, Gladys. Gladys, yeah. Gladys, I don't know if you can hear us, but we're, we're getting close to the end of this. But... Um, you're welcome to, to hang out with us as, as we wrap things up. So that's, that's where we get that day for a year. So putting all that together, when do the 2,300 years begin? So we know those 2,300 days are actually going to be prophetic. So it's a period of 2,300 years. Let's look at Daniel 8.14. And that's Paula. Actually, we've read this one many, many times already tonight. Mm -hmm. But that's just as, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. I'm going to let, I'm going to let her read the next one, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Okay. You can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Yeah, you're not <laughs> muted this time. We can hear you. <laughs> All right. Um, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make rec reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, in 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. All right. So a couple of things to point out here. First, we know that the 2300 years begins mm -hmm. during the time of the Medes and Persians. We know that the 70 weeks it's part of that prophecy. Mm -hmm. And it says here that the starting point was, it says in verse 25, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that's 69 weeks. Mm -hmm. Right now, remember, each day is a year. So mm -hmm. that's 69 years. No, it's not 69 years. 69 times seven. Right, I'm sorry. Seven, I'm still, I'll right? you. <laughs> so, and that comes to where it said he would be anointed. So that takes us to the time of Jesus' baptism. And the command to go forth and uh, restore and build Jerusalem 
uh, is found. Well, we're, we're going to get to that here. Let me redo this. That's found in uh, Ezra, Nehemiah. You read about that. The several years after the vision, right? The angel, same angel, Gabriel, appeared to Daniel to give him a message so that he would understand the vision. Because remember, Daniel fainted. It, mm -hmm. it was too much for him. Uh, so helping him to understand the vision of the 2300 days. The 70 week prophecy in those verses helps us to understand the prophetic time element, Daniel 8 14. The verb decreed at the beginning of Daniel 9 24, which is best translated as apportioned or cut off, that specifically suggests that the 70 weeks compose a part of the longer period, 2300 days. Thus, the 70 week prophecy is cut off from us at the starting point for the prophetic time period. So that's the first part of that 2300 days. In Daniel 9, 24 through 27, the beginning of the 70 weeks is marked by the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The book of Ezra reports on three decrees that concern Jerusalem and the temple, but only the third reported in Ezra 7, 12 through 26 is the most effective one. The Persian king Artaxerxes I issued the decree in 457 BC. It involves both the reconstruction of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem as a political and administrative center. The other two didn't do that. They would only pertain to a portion of that. In the Bible, only this decree is followed by thanksgiving that praises God for influencing the king. Furthermore, only with 457 7 BC as a starting point, do the 70 weeks, which is 490 years, reach the time of Christ the Messiah. Thus, the prophecy of the 70 weeks provides a precise event to date the beginning of the 2300 evenings and mornings. They start in 457 BC and end after 2300 years in AD 1844. So it's the whole point of that 70 weeks prophecy in there was to help us get an, a starting point that we can identify so we know when it began and we know when it ends. Mm -hmm. Notice this was over 160 years ago, 1844, right? It's a long time. Yeah. Now that oddly enough is where we're going to leave off tonight because that leads us to our next topic, which we'll explore next week, which is our prophetic message. All right. So that's going to be an interesting uh, topic. We're going to look a little bit more into the three angels message and uh, the 1844 issue, but it'll be a great study. And as always, a uh, free recommended resource, uh, compromise, conformity, and courage, because we talked about there, how should we be living today, knowing what we know? Uh, and this is a great book there. Uh, and you can get it for free. Amazing Facts website under the free book library and download it or read it online we're going to close out with just a word of prayer and then we'll stop the recording don't don't run off just yet but I, I have a quick uh something i want to discuss with the group before we move on dear heavenly father we thank you for this study this evening lord we Amen. thank you for the guidance you've provided in your word for the wisdom you've given us to understand these things and for the explanations you've given to make your word clear lord we ask that you will help us to internalize it, help us to understand the importance of the times that we live in, Lord, and help us to live right so that we may take your message to those who need to hear it. We ask, Lord, that you will be with us as we enter into your Sabbath day, Lord. Give us peace. Give us rest. Thank you for asking things in Christ. Amen. 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 All right. So let's stop the recording. Oh, if I get the...